started, if you wouldn't mind, if you could just type your name and your field of study, whatever your, your focus is, uh, into the chat, just to kind of see who's here and also where you live. I love that we're opening up these workshops and making them uh, for people, you know, across the UH system. It's kind of fun to see if where everyone's from. So what's your home campus? What are you studying? Oh, great. All kinds of people. Oh, radiology technician. That's a lot of intense reading. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for your little uh, information about you. Kind of, it is helps me to see because every every subject area is going to be a little bit different. Um, it's kind of cool to see all the different um, backgrounds and focuses. Yeah, a little bit of everything. So, I think first of all, if you're here at this workshop, you're really ahead of the game. And one of the things that I realize is I really wish I would have taken advantage of these kinds of workshops uh, as a student myself. I probably would have done a lot better in my undergraduate studies. Um, so thank you for taking your time on a Friday to come and learn more about reading. I think, like I said, the fact that you're here says an awful lot about your um, ability to succeed. And I hope that this workshop tells you some things that maybe you hadn't thought of related to reading. So I'm going to just go ahead and get started. And um, you don't have to have your camera on. If you want to have it on, you can. I'm actually going to be sharing my screen for most of it. So um, yeah. It's up to you to decide if you want to have screens on or off. But I hope that when I ask a question, you'll be able to jump in and maybe, um, you know, throw some stuff in the chat. Oh, on the wrong slide. Let me go backwards through it. Rookie mistake. All right. So today's presentation is it's all about reading and how to be more successful uh, with your reading in school. And I think it's fairly obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway, that the reading we do in school is a lot different from the kind of reading we do on our own. You know, a lot of us read things on our cell phone, we read on the screen, you know, this day and age. I don't know how many of you actually also read books for fun. Um, some people do. But one of the things that is important, it's really important to note, is that reading for school is an entirely different skill. And like all skills, uh, it's something that you need to practice to get good at. Um, most people um, are a little surprised when they first start having to read the really challenging college level texts, how, how hard it is to stay focused. So maybe in the chat, if you could all just chat, throw in there, what are you struggling with? Um, what's hard for you in your classes right now? What, what's something that you are challenged by when it comes to reading? Pop it in the chat. Yeah, technical words, long readings. Kind of finding what's important, comprehension, yes. Annotations. Yeah. Dane, your comment about memorizing stuff is, is really helpful, right? We, our brains aren't really trained to memorize information in the same way that they might have been years ago. Yeah, remembering what you've just read. So those issues, fairly common um, and not unusual because as I said, this is a skill that you need to cultivate. And you know what? This is a typical Zoom moment. My cat is freaking out on the other side of the sliding glass door. So excuse me for one second while I let him in so he doesn't have a nervous breakdown. awkward Zoom moments with pets. Another one. Um, anyway, so what we're trying to do here today is just talk about ways that you can um, 
set up the right environment to improve your comprehension, improve your learning, therefore improving your ability to do well in your classes, right? But another thing that's important to note is that all of these skills, like any skill, they take practice, right? So keep that in mind. Yeah. One of the things that I think we forget sometimes is that good focused reading takes a lot of time. And your time is really valuable. You want to make sure as students that the time that you're spending reading is time that you're actually spending learning. And I don't know how many of you have ever had that experience of um, reading two or three or four or five pages and then suddenly realizing that you have not remembered anything or that you were thinking about something else the entire time, right? There goes 30 minutes down the drain if that's happened to you, right? And so you're effectively wasting your time if you're not employing the best strategies. Um, another thing to point out about time is that we live in a world where we're being pulled at by all kinds of different distractions. And I wonder how many of you, again in the chat, uh, <laughs> sorry about the cat situation, but yeah, people can relate. Um, in the chat, maybe you could type a little thing in there about what distracts you when you're trying to read? What are the things that you're thinking about when you should be paying attention to your reading? Yeah, other responsibilities, <laughs> everything distracts you. <laughs> and if you're like me, my cat, <laughs> your other classes. Oh my God, there is my cat again. He is terrible. I don't know what's going on with him. Hold on one second. Awkward. Anyway, you can tell who rules the, the house in my house. It's my cat. His name is Bacon. Um, yeah, so there's lots of distractions and annoying cats in your life. And I'm surprised, did anybody think maybe their phone was a distraction? Anybody distracted by their phones or by other things they might be accessing online, like social media, TikTok? Right? We live in a world that is designed <laughs> to distract us, right? <laughs> so, yeah, people calling us on the phone, people texting us, maybe we're getting notifications. Um, one of the things that I'm going to just recommend, and this is kind of, maybe I'm, I'm stretching a little bit outside of what, what is considered reading success, but I'm going to come out and say it. And that is that unless we can get control of those distractions and reduce them, it's going to be very hard for you to employ any successful reading strategies. And it's going to make it very, very hard for you to improve um, your recall, your memorization, right? Anything that makes noise like your cat scratching on the door, whatever, right? So. If you know that you're easily distracted, I strongly recommend using an app on your phone, like the Freedom app is one of the really good ones. There's a few other ones where you can actually set it up so that it shuts down all notifications on your phone for a certain amount of time. It may be kind of a luxury. Um, those kinds of things. Also, you can use Freedom on your computer, right? And you can set it up so that whatever you're doing that's what you're doing for an hour. Um, and that's especially useful with digital texts because, you know, when you're reading on one screen, what's to stop you from clicking on another one to see, I don't know, what's happening somewhere else um, that's way more interesting than maybe the textbook that you're having to read. So whatever you can do to set up that time, let's just say 30 minutes, to make sure that, that, that in that 30 minute period, you're actually doing something, you're engaged, 
you're focused, and you're learning, then that's 30 minutes that you're walking away with something important for you, okay? And Calix, that's a good comment about your mom calling. You might want to, you know, just send your mom a note and say, hey, I'm trying to study here so that I can get good grades in college and maybe call me back in an hour. You know, sometimes it helps to set up boundaries for our family members too. So that, And I think most of our families want to support us as we better ourselves. So just something to think about. Or maybe just put your phone on silent. Whatever works. We don't want to offend the mama. Um, so try thinking about ways you can create not just an actual physical environment that's good, you know, distraction free, but a digital environment that's distraction free. Um, and it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but it really will make a big difference um, in your ability to comprehend and, and, and recall information. Yeah. So it's really important that as beginning readers, and all of you, you might be thinking, I'm not a beginning reader. I've been reading for a long time. But you might be a beginning reader when it comes to like advanced medical texts, <laughs> right? Or textbooks, books that are not exactly written with um, the ease of the reader in mind, right? Some textbooks are really, really challenging. So you might be a beginner in that sense, okay? Really spend some time being honest with yourself about what you do now, what works, and what doesn't work for you, okay? How many of you, just a show of hands, how many of you use highlighter pens? I'm just curious. <laughs> okay, I see a couple of hands. And for those of you that do use highlighter pens, maybe just throw in the chat. Does that work for you? Just a simple yes or no. That's good. Um, perhaps you use highlighter pens and something else. Um, I kind of hope that you will. Um, but maybe by the end of the session, you'll have something to add to your um, your highlighter pen arsenal. Uh, one of the issues that I have with highlighter pens is that a lot of people misuse them. They wind up with, I mean, these days, so many digital texts, but old school texts, right, you wind up highlighting the whole page. And um, maybe that's not the most effective use of the highlighter pen. If it works for you, if it really does, then consider me wrong, okay? But um, maybe we can talk about some ways that you can add to your use of the highlighter pen. Um, but there are a lot of things that we do as readers um, that if we're being honest with ourselves, we realize they don't work, right? Um, how many of you have a hard time staying awake when you're reading? Raise your hand. <laughs> right? <laughs> everyone and I don't know I think it's a habit that a lot of us have that we read um, before we go to bed at night and so it's like we've trained ourselves to use reading to put us to sleep um, and I don't know if that would if you know I, I don't want to dispute the value of getting read to or reading to yourself before you go to sleep um, but I really think it's important to set up an environment so that you are not cueing yourself to go to sleep. And the time of day that you do your reading, right, that's going to have a big impact on whether or not you can stay awake. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of things that you could do just by reshuffling your approach. Like maybe just keep doing what you're doing, but do it at a different time. Like, how many of you are doing your reading as the last thing at the end of the day? Like, moms, you've got kids and you're juggling, um, you know, all of the things that you have, and dads, all the things that you have throughout the day, right? Um, and then you read at the very end of the day, and of course you fall asleep, right? It makes sense that you would. So I don't think I'm delivering any kind of miracle uh, advice here when I say maybe consider reading things 
at a time when you are more likely to be able to stay awake and focus. Yeah, and I talked about having an organized study zone in the sense that, right, you want to make sure that your technology isn't set up in a way that it's going to be distracting to you, okay? Use an app like Freedom. Um, there's a website called uh, the Center for Humane Technology that has a lot of really good advice about how you can stop that constant um, pull and distraction of technology, right? And the other thing that's so fascinating about it is that it was created by a lot of the same people who made the technology distracting, <laughs> those jerks. Um, but anyway, check out the Center for, for Humane Technology if you're interested in finding out more about how you can um, kind of, uh, I guess, silence the, the noise from all of that stuff uh, going on around you. Um, but yeah, have an organized physical space, right? Or learn where you can go on your campus and it depends on where you are, you know, Leeward, I'm sure. I, I remember they have an amazing library, um, UH Maui College, we have the library, right, set up. And then there are, there's this, the student center. There's a lot of really great places on campus with Wi-Fi and access. Um, some of them are gonna be quieter than others, right? But learn about the resources that are available to you on your campus if you're unable to set up a physical space in your home because of space constraints, right? A lot of us live in, in tight environments where we have to share space with family members and that's fine, right? But then you have to sort of take it upon yourself to find another location or you can again, you know, involve your family and ask them to, you know, be quiet for 20 or 30 minutes while you're reading. Um, there are some other ways that you can involve your family in your reading too that I'm going to talk about um, in another slide, so we'll get to that. But anyway, an organized study zone is a good thing to have as well. Yeah, so every time you read for school, right, set a goal for that session um, before you start reading. You don't just sit down and start reading. But understand that not everything that you read is going to demand the same level of focus, right? Um, sometimes we read things for writing classes that demand that we, you know, analyze the piece for writing strategies. Sometimes we are in a humanities class where we have to think about things like themes, right? Um, sometimes you're in uh, a health class where you know you have to pass that class in order to get into your study, your focus for your career, right? Like there are very high stakes classes and of course you want to prioritize those and maybe, you know, increase the amount of time you spend, work a little harder to make sure that you're employing all of these strategies than for the assignments that are maybe not quite as important. Right? The classes that are easy, the texts that are short and accessible. Yeah. So what are you reading and why are you reading it? And have a plan and an approach before you start. Right? The level of difficulty of the text is going to really affect your strategy. Uh, I can tell you that my freshman year of college, I had a sociology text that was written by a terrible writer and some of the sentences were like an entire paragraph long. It was so hard to read that textbook. Um, turned me off of sociology for years <laughs> as a result. Very poorly written text. Um, and it, it was just, I had to work extra hard to pay attention because it wasn't designed um, for me. So I want you all to think about that. Like, is this a a class that you're particularly challenged by? Is this a class that you absolutely need to get an A in, right? All of those things should factor into how you decide you're going to approach the text, right? More difficult texts are more important. Um, assignments that are longer are going to require a little bit more of a, a tactical approach. So set a goal for each session. The other thing that I should say about setting a goal is make sure that your reading sessions are reasonable. 
I don't know how many times when I was in school people would, you know, say, oh, I'm going to study all day Sunday. You know, I have, I have a window Sunday night. I'm going to do all my homework Sunday night. So that to me implies that they're doing all of their work Sunday night. Yeah, and that is not a good strategy. Okay, the average human attention span, does anybody know what it is? If you do, you can type it in the chat. What's the average human attention span? <laughs> Some of us have shorter than average. Yeah, 45 minutes is actually a little long for the average. Yeah, 25 to 30 minutes is the average human attention span, right? And I think it's safe to say that many of us have developed the skill of extending, <laughs> but not all of us, all, not all of us have. So it's, a, it's so much easier to organize your life around multiple short reading bursts than it is to say, I'm going to read for two and a half hours on a Sunday. It's just, it doesn't make any sense given what we know about how we learn to try and approach assignments that way. And for those of you who are procrastinators, right? Um, it actually tends to make procrastination worse when we set up a huge big block of time because it's like you're standing at the bottom of a giant mountain looking up and going, God, I'm never going to make it to the top, right? So shorter reading assignments say, I can, I'm just going to read for 10 minutes. I'm going to read for 15 minutes, right? And it, and it just makes it easier to develop the habit because it's a lot easier to give up that 10 minutes something to try for you yeah so as I said before I'll repeat myself try using some focus apps to make sure that you're not getting um, notifications on your phone or distractions from social media while you're reading um, you can set a reminder and an alarm a timer so if you're gonna read for 20 minutes the timer can go off in 20 minutes uh, break your larger readings into small chunks as i just said um, i think it's a good idea to survey your readings before you start so when your um, professors give you uh, a homework assignment before you leave class you know before you do anything sit down and take a look how many pages are there how difficult of, is the text how difficult is the content um, how important is it for your midterm or your final exam, right? And that's gonna affect, back to what I was saying before, the strategies that you take to approach that reading are gonna be affected by that information, right? Um, if it's just a short, easy read, you know that you probably don't have to spend so much time strategizing and you can just leap right in. Okay, there's a, a technique that a, a lot of schools teach um, to their students it's called sq3r and there's a lot of variations on this approach right back to what i was saying like try something you haven't tried and see if it works if it doesn't work tweak it right make it your own but scan the sq3r just stands for scan question read and recall and it's a academic reading approach right the scanning is where you look at like what's the length of the text that you're having to read and those things like looking at the subheadings and the titles, right? Kind of starting to develop um, some questions that you have that you might want to answer about what's happening in that chapter. Some textbooks have questions at the end that you can use to kind of stay focused, right? As you read, uh, and then you can read. If you use a highlighter, I strongly, strongly recommend that you do something besides just highlight. I'm gonna get to that in a minute. And then you want to set up an opportunity to go back and recall the information. And earlier I was talking about how you might engage your family in learning how to be a better reader. One of the best things to do is to report out to someone else what you just read. So if you have a kid, you can have the smartest toddler on the planet, right? Just give them a little summary of the information that you just read in their language that they might kind of understand um, if you don't have a toddler you know you can go find someone else's or you can talk to a partner um, talk to a classmate right this is a good opportunity to 
read in groups and then discuss, right? That act of reading and then explaining to someone else really can help you to create those sticky moments, right? Where the information is going to stay in your brain. Yeah, always read for the big ideas first, right? Keep asking yourself, what's new? What's confusing? How can I apply this? I like those three questions. What's new? What's confusing? How can I apply this? And those just three questions can really help you to kind of stay on task. And they work for any setting, you know, like really anything that you're reading. What's new? What's confusing? How can I apply this? You can also use those questions to help you um, kind of craftily annotate. And it seemed like somebody mentioned annotation uh, really can be a really important and useful aspect of um, academic reading. So sorry, this is a, I blew up this image too much. It got all blurry, but you get the idea. Have a strategy for staying focused while you read. And one of the strate strategies that I like to use is some kind of note taking feature. So Cornell Notes is a great way to go. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever used Cornell Notes. There are a ton of resources in YouTube if you've not um, ever tried Cornell Notes. Um, that explain the process really well. And again, like any of these techniques, you can, nobody's going to come in and, and check, you know, how you've divvied up your page or whether or not that you've done it correctly, right? It's more about here's an idea <laughs> for how you can kind of keep things organized and give it a try if you've not tried Cornell Notes. Um, a lot of times we think of note taking as something that we do for a lecture. But when you think about it, a lecture is just a spoken version of a text, right? Um, and texts oftentimes are very dense. Uh, and so taking notes in this way can really help you to figure out which information is important, right? Somebody mentioned that in their comment, like that was something that they struggled with. I don't know what, what to study for the exam, right? looking for the main idea, like over here. So it's looking for the main idea. Uh, maybe you have some questions, right? And then you can go back at the end in the recall and write a summary. Give it a try, Cornell Notes. It's, it, you know, people who aren't in Cornell use Cornell Notes. Um, I really like this example, kind of somebody, somebody's from Pinterest, so like their own personal um, use of like this was for I think a healthcare class um, and I like this because it uses like the color coding and and but it, this person has obviously taken the Cornell notes idea and kind of made it into their own um, so you can see you've got the questions over here right and then over here you've got the answers and then the person has come up with their own kind of color coding and they use, right, the pink for vocabulary words. I think that's kind of fun. One of the things that, you know, I've had a lot of people ask me if, if I recommend doing like mind mapping and stuff like that. And I absolutely do for subjects that are super challenging for you. So like, let's say you have to take an organic chemistry class and you know that's gonna be really, really hard for you then I might up the ante and, and make a little bit more effort to create some sort of visual interpretation of the information that I'm learning from the text. Um, it's not worth it for every single subject though. You have to think about the time you spend in, and I've seen some people with beautiful notes, like you just wanna, you wanna post them on Pinterest. But that might not be the most efficient and effective way of learning things. So just, and if you're tempted to try to make your notes look like they belong on Pinterest, um, maybe don't unless um, you can really see the value in, in that. Yeah. Vocabulary words. Okay, this is, this is something that we don't talk about a lot, but it's super important because imagine this. You're reading a text and you can only understand half of the words you're reading. Do you think that's gonna affect your ability to learn the information and recall it, to comprehend it? 
you know, rhetorical question, but I'll bet you're all shaking your heads on the other side of your screens, right? Of course, if you don't understand what you're reading, you're not going to be able to remember it, much less learn it, right? So it's really important that you set the goal now to improve your vocabulary. And I, I would say like any needed vocabulary for what you're going to study in the future, super important. Um, as a student, if you set the goal aside from what your professors are telling you to do, but you sort of set the goal for yourself that you're going to learn two new words every day. And maybe that just involves going the extra mile, writing down words in your notes, looking them up, right? You shouldn't stop and look up every single new vocabulary word that you encounter, right? We use context clues to try and figure out what words mean. And sometimes that's enough to get us through, right? But that's not gonna help you. And especially if you're in like a medical or science field um, three or four years from now, okay? You're gonna need to learn that vocabulary and you're gonna need to build on it as you go. And as you go, it's gonna get more advanced. There's gonna be more terminology, okay? And so start now, save yourself the frustration of getting you know journal articles in a class that you really don't understand because you haven't improved your vocabulary and just make that part of your own i guess learning kuleana right like you're gonna you're gonna go out there and you're gonna make it part of your job as a student um, to imp improve your vocabulary intentionally um, i get like the word of the day from the oxford dictionary people like that email and I am, you know, I'm an English professor, but I'm still learning new words. I still stop and look stuff up. I also speak Spanish. I'm always learning new words in Spanish. So the fun never ends. There are some really great apps for creating flashcards, right? If you're in a foreign language class or um, a physiology class, anatomy class where you have to memorize, flashcards can work. Um, there's a lot of good ways that you can learn vocabulary, but it's going to be something that you have to do now for a year from now. And it's not an instant gratification thing. Like if you're challenged by vocabulary now, um, you're not going to be able to just flick the switch and then have a better vocabulary. It's something you have to start committing to now and just, yeah, old school, keep a, keep a vocabulary notebook. Um, one of those little tiny little spiral notebooks or you know have an app in your phone where you jot stuff down uh, in any case you will absolutely benefit from you know one or two words a day you know keep it small and attainable and your vocabulary will grow and you will be surprised by that so I want to make sure I'm not missing anyone's information in the chat. No? Okay. So e-texts. Just before I get started on this topic, can I get a show of hands? How many of you do school readings? And be honest, on your cell phone. Raise your hand if you read for school on your cell phone. No, I didn't see any hands pop up. Can't see everybody because I've got, I'm on share screen. So I'm sorry if I miss you. That's good because the numbers show that there are a lot of people doing reading on their cell phones and you shouldn't be because we do all kinds of things on our cell phones and our brains are not designed to retain information that we see on such a tiny screen. It's terrible for your eyes. Um, but we do use a lot of e-text and I'm sure a lot of you have e-texts um, for some class. I'm actually using um, IDAP for one of my classes, the, my English 100 class for the first time. So uh, what I recommend is taking physical notes somewhere. You know, I have students who really like to take notes in Google Docs, um, but as it turns out, Handwritten notes are just 
better for our recall. There are some tools, Instapaper, Digo are a couple of tools that you can use to take notes um, on, on digital texts, right? And then a lot of the school textbooks uh, have annotation capabilities and note taking capabilities, but sometimes it's a learning curve in itself. Uh, I really recommend if you're in a class and there's an e-text and you don't have a lot of experience with that e-text, talk to your professors and ask them if they have somebody who was in that class before who did really well and ask them what they did, um, what, what techniques, because there's a lot of like little tools in e-texts that, you know, people just don't even know are there half the time. So something to do ask people who seem like they know what's what, see if they, you can learn from each other. Um, really, really important, more and more people are developing eye problems, migraines, um, you know, neck problems related to posture, sitting at desks. Um, so one of the recommendations is if you're doing a lot of work on the screen is that you spend you know, 20 minutes reading, and then you need to look up and stare about 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And what that does is it helps your your eyes to refocus and helps to prevent eye strain um, a little bit. But anyway, just have to really be, I think, more mindful, get up and walk around. Physical movement, by the way, is another way that you can help stay focused. So. I know a lot of people who read while they're on a treadmill. Um, you can listen to audio versions of your text and have it read to you, right? There are a lot of really little cool techniques that you can use um, that are gonna be sort of dependent on you and, and what works. Back to what I was saying, like what works for one person doesn't work for somebody else for sure, yeah. Whatever you're doing as a reader, think about the way you've learned successfully in the past and recreate that, right? What you're trying to do is carve multiple pathways in your brain. So you need to loop back. Let's just say, you know, you're in your chemistry class and you're reading chapters, right? You should always go back and review if you have a 20 minute session for reading, spend five minutes reviewing the preceding chapters, right? Reviewing your old notes and make that an intentional part of your reading process. And what that's gonna do is help you to recall information in the moment of an exam uh, or whatever it is research that you have to apply. And it's just gonna make you an all around better reader. So hopefully I've said something here today that's gonna help you to, I don't know, um, be more successful as a student and get those things that you want. What I really appreciate is if you wouldn't mind taking a minute to write in the chat, if you, if you haven't fallen asleep yet, um, one thing that you've gotten from this conversation that you could apply um, in any of your classes. What's one thing that I said that you're gonna take away and actually try to use. I hope I hope a few people jump in. Just make me feel better about myself, please. Share one thing that you've gotten from this conversation. That's good. Yeah, Cornell notes are awesome, by the way. There's some other note-taking techniques out there. Here's a tip for all of you. I'm glad you reminded me I was gonna say this and then I forgot. Um, look up videos for Cornell Notes, and I'm sure KLEE probably has some resources. Uh, all of your learning centers, they have resources like little short videos, how-tos, right? But there are some other styles of note-taking that are particular to different fields. So like you might ask your professors if they have a particular style of note-taking um, that they recommend that's maybe a, a variation. Yeah, eye strain, man. It's it is real. I have neck problems, eye problems. Yeah, 20 20 20. Just remember every 20 minutes, stop, 
look up at the horizon for at least 20 seconds. Great. Does anybody have any questions for me? Seems like no. Well, I want to just thank all of you, like I said, for coming in and sitting through this 45-minute Zoom session. Hopefully you got something. It seems like maybe some of you got something that you can apply to be more successful. I hope you have a great weekend. You're welcome. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Morgan, you just, um, Professor Andalus, you've done just a, a wonderful job. Thank you so much for taking the time out to present to us. I've also placed a link for the feedback. Uh, let us know how we're doing and how we can continue to provide excellent programming for you. Also, if your teacher is going to give you extra credit, you can fill out that form as well, and we'll be sure to send them your information. Also, keep us on your radar for next Friday's SC workshop. We'll be presenting on how to write concisely for science writing. So um, sometimes you may not have uh, kind of thought about, you know, what's the difference between um, the traditional uh, college writing as well as science writing. So you'll be in for a treat for that one. So have a successful day and we'll see you for another Success Connection workshop. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a good weekend.